To your friends, grace and peace to you this morning from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, so sociologists today frequently note that in the last 15 years, uh, national politics have become increasingly central to American identity. Uh, they have also boldly asserted that the sky is blue. By the way, I'm like, well, duh, right? We're make a big deal out of politics. Uh, but no, what they mean is this feeling that I think a lot of us have already, uh, that pretty much everything now gets politicized is actually a sociological fact. Uh, that Western civilization as a whole, and maybe more specifically, American culture in particular, has elevated its political life to the level of existential importance. And in fact, many sociologists have argued, and I think it's a convincing argument, that as the quote-unquote Christian religion, their terminology, not mine, but as the Christian religion has become less and less influential, the now default religion of the secular West is one's political affiliation. To quote G.K. Chesterton, writing in the 1800s, but a student of history, he had seen this happen all over the place before, uh, he said, once abolish the God, and eventually the government becomes the God. And so you see, for a lot of Americans, our loyalty to our political leaders and our conformity to our political parties has in fact taken on cultic-like qualities, uh, meaning it's an unthinking, uncritical allegiance, as evidenced by the fact that uh, by the fact that Republicans and Democrats alike seem un utterly unable to see, or maybe just completely unwilling to acknowledge, the all too obvious flaws of their current presidential candidates. It's like watching the emperor's new clothes in real time. Like, our candidate is great. I'm like, is anyone else seeing what I'm seeing right now? Like, uh, but no, you're not allowed to say anything, at least not to the people who prefer the candidate. Uh, by the way, it's one of my like, side goals this morning to offend both sides of the political aisle. So <laughs> just hang with me, okay? There's a reason for that. Uh, but no, the good news is, of course, you and I in this room, Christians at large in the country, we do not fall into that mistake of making too much of our politics. Alas, that is not true. You see, because what studies for the last decade have been showing is that even the majority of Christians, when surveyed, have outlooks and opinions that are much more formed by their political affiliation than they are by their faith. Or maybe more specifically, what the data shows is we agree with the parts of the Bible that support our political position, and it's like we don't even see the parts that do not support us. And so now even the church landscape in America almost always gets interpreted through a political lens. Is this a conservative church or a liberal church? It's always fun when people show up on Easter. Is this a conservative church or a liberal church? Uh, which for what it's worth, those are not theological terms. Those are political terms. The theological ones, which we ought to prefer, if only because they're reflective of biblical concepts, would be orthodox teaching versus heterodox teaching or sound doctrine versus heresy. That's actually talked about in the Bible. These are the much more important categories, I would argue. And yet we do not use those terms, not only because they're a little bit weird, which they are, I agree, uh, but also because we don't think in those categories. Now we almost exclusively think now in political categories, Christian or non-Christian, we all think in political categories. And so again, everything has become politicized. The church is politicized. Our schools are politicized. The culture at large is politicized. Our artistic award shows, it's like politics on steroids. I don't even, uh, and so on that front, shortly after World War II, Winston Churchill said something that is proving, I think, proving prophetic. And in particular, he said that the empires of the future would not be empires of just economic or military might, uh, but that they would be, quote, empires of the mind. And what he meant by that is they would subtly infiltrate the way that you thought. The way that you see would color the way that you see pretty much everything, conservative or liberal, right? Uh, that they would operate not as a tyrannical force from outside of you, but as an equally, if not even more tyrannical force from inside of you. That they would be, therefore, even more difficult to resist and be free from, if only because they would be more difficult for us to identify and see is what an empire of the mind is. And the modern West is, in fact, an empire of the mind. Quietly coercing conformity to a culture that is, yes, good in many ways. Don't mishear me on this front. And I mean that, truly. There's a lot of good in modern American culture. Uh, I would personally prefer this particular empire to that of Nazi Germany. 
or North Korea, or even the Roman Empire of antiquity. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, Nevertheless, like every empire in the history of man, no matter how good, it is not God. Maybe the better way to put it, it is not the kingdom of God. And people of Christ, you and I, we have this dual citizenship in this life. Uh, The empires of the world on the one hand and the kingdom of God on the other. We belong to both of these things. Uh, And the concern that we ought to have with this data that is coming out is that we become so shaped by the former, the empires of men, that we no longer properly live as the latter, citizens of the kingdom. And so why am I talking about this? If we go to our passage, it's Palm Sunday. It's great to talk about politics on Palm Sunday. That was the advice I got from someone. Um, No, (laughs) it's Palm Sunday. It's the day on which Christ rode into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. And the thing about this event, what scholars have noted, is that this act of riding into Jerusalem was meant to convey something very specific. And in particular, they say it was an act of subverting the empire. Uh, What they mean by that is back in the days of Jesus, a new ruler riding into a city was actually a relatively common event. This was not unknown to people. And in particular, the empire back then was Rome. And if the Roman Empire conquered your city, what would happen is they would send in a new ruler. This new ruler would get up on a horse. He would ride into the city, all of it to much fanfare. Does this look familiar? Uh, This was going to be their new king. And you see, by the end of the week, this new kingdom would issue a proclamation to their new territory. And that proclamation was literally called, quote, the Gospel of Caesar Augustus. Was the real name of it. So notice the parallels with what Jesus does. Almost exactly parallel to today's passage. Jesus rides into the city, all of it to much fanfare. He's their new king, right? Uh, At the end of the week, there is a gospel that gets issued out, not just to a new territory, but to the whole world is what he's claiming. And so it's the same kind of thing in a lot of ways. And yet notice, if you pay close attention to the details of what Christ did, whereas on the one hand, it looks like he's just following a common trope for that day and age. On the other hand, with a few subtle changes, he's completely turning it on its head. It's a subversive act. A donkey instead of a war horse, that's saying something about his kingdom. A cross instead of a throne, that's also saying something about his kingdom. A gospel that gives you something instead of just demanding things. It's a very different kind of kingdom. And see, what Christ is doing in that is he's subverting the empires of man, not just Rome, but for all time. And he's establishing instead the kingdom of God. And so what I want to do for the rest of this is I want to look at some of those details, like some of those differences, that is, In terms of what Christ did, each of which, each little difference, I think conveys something about the nature of his kingdom and therefore how to be kind of a participant in it, right? Uh, And it's three things. I'm just going to name them and then we'll jump into them. But it's first, the kingdom of God is marked not by hubris, but humility. Someone after the first step is like, what's hubris? Um, H-U-B-R-I-S, kind of like pride and pomp. It's marked by hubris, not by hubris, but by humility. Second, it comes to us not through force but through faith. Third, its reign is not just temporary, but eternal. So let's start with the first thing. It's a kingdom that's marked not by hubris, but humility. So John uh, John Piper is a Baptist pastor. He's very well known in evangelical circles. I don't know if you've heard of him before. Uh, He's known because he's a very good preacher. Uh, He also has a longstanding friendship with John MacArthur of Master's College and also Grace Community Church. Uh, But back in October of 2019, October 2019, what was coming just a month later? So just like a couple weeks before the presidential election, uh, John Piper had the audacity to write an article critiquing the political climate of our country. Uh, Not any candidate per se, and I think if you know John Piper, he would levy his critique at both sides of the political aisle. And in particular, what he was critiquing, or what he was arguing, is he was hearing a lot of Christians say that when you vote, you just got to vote on the basis of someone's policies. I feel like I say that. You vote, you just vote on the basis of policies, meaning it doesn't really matter who the person is, just vote policy. Uh, what kind of character flaws they have, don't worry about it. It's just, are their policies good? That's the only question you should ask. The thing is, Piper did not downplay the importance of policy. That stuff really does matter. But what he argued, 
is that it's not just policy that influences the direction of a, nat of a nation, but also people or persons. And what he meant by that is he thinks that the character flaws of our leaders, and actually not just character flaws, but flat out sins of our political leaders ought to concern Christians much more than they do. And so here's a quote from Piper, so you can get kind of the gist of the article. He says, I think it is a drastic mistake to think that the deadly influences of a leader come only through his policies and not, on, not also through his person. Things like flagrant boastfulness, vulgarity, immorality, and factiousness, like being really divisive, are not only self-incriminating, but also nation-corrupting. They move out from centers of influence to infect whole cultures. And the thing about this idea, this is not just John Piper, it's scattered all over the Old Testament. Not to mention human history. But specifically the Old Testament, the nation of Israel, whenever they had a king whose, uh, whose character was questionable, which was pretty much like all the time, uh, it seemed to trickle down into the habits and mindsets of the people. And that's what John Piper was pointing out. That if your primary leader is combative, your body politic will become combative. That if your primary leader is divisive, your body politic will eventually become divided. That if your primary leader cuts people down with their tongue, which all of our political leaders now do that, then your body politic will eventually begin to cut each other down with their tongues. Do we not see this? I don't know how in the world this is a controversial point that he made, uh, but you see, the thing is, John Piper wrote this article and he got thoroughly attacked. That's right, yeah. <laughs> he got thoroughly attacked, but by who? By Christians. On both sides of the political aisle, aisle, which I would suggest simply proved his point. That no matter the side of the aisle doing it, you elevate and ele elect a political class that is combative, condescending, and mean, and eventually your citizens also begin to speak in ways that are combative, condescending, and mean. Uh, I'm not that old. Some people that say I look like I'm 16, I think I've heard, but... Not 16, I'm 41. My voice just cracks. Maybe I am 16, I don't know. Uh, but even I, in that brief time, um, I have seen a palpable change. Uh, the hubris that unfortunately many, many Christians have begun to fall into. Which kingdom are we really part of? So in our passage, we go to that. Christ rides into Jerusalem and the thing is, whenever a new ruler would do this, uh, maybe picked up on this detail earlier, Pastor Matt shared it in the children's message as well, but they would always ride in on a horse. Uh, not just any kind, of norse, any, any kind of horse, but always like the biggest and baddest horse you could find. It was always a war horse that they would ride in on. The thing is, it was meant to intimidate people. It was meant to be, you could say, very combative and condescending as a move. It was meant to kind of put people in their place. And yet you go to the passage, what does Christ do? I would suggest he totally makes fun of that. God himself makes a mockery of our pride. How so? Instead of a big bad war horse, he just gets on the foal of a donkey. Uh, this humble, lowly work animal that back then was primarily associated with the poor. It's sending a totally different message. And that's because it's establishing a totally different kingdom. Instead of creating a culture that is combative, condescending, and mean, Christ came to create a genuine counterculture that is humble and lowly and meek. In other words, a people who interpret the actions of others charitably, a people who are quick to acknowledge their own faults and failures and contributions to the problem, a people who are generally speaking less demanding than others are patient and kind. They'll know you're my disciples by your combativeness. Huh? No. They'll know you're my disciples by your, by your love, Christ says on Monday, Thursday. Piper's point, the character of a king always trickles down 
to the character of his citizens. It's just, who's really our king? It's been said that you can always tell who reigns your heart by paying attention to the words that you speak. And to put it in the words of Jesus, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So who do we sound more like as a people? The politicians and pundits of our current culture? Or Jesus? Humility instead of hubris. That's the first characteristic of our king. And therefore the first characteristic of his kingdom. Now let's go to the second. The kingdom of Christ comes to us not through force, but through faith. And just to explain what I mean by that, force, not faith. Oh, no, sorry. Faith, not force. Don't mess those up. Um, so about a month ago on MSNBC, my favorite news station, right after I flip off a of Fox News, right, and just, I go between the two, anyway. <laughs> but no, sorry, I should not say that. Uh, but about a month ago on MSNBC, uh, there was a correspondent by the name of Heidi Brisbella, uh, and she made some comments that caused kind of a stir at the time. And in particular, she was talking about what she referred to as Christian nationalism. Now, if you're not familiar with the term, Christian nationalism is just one of the many phrases that gets translated actually more accurately as can of worms. Like, don't open it up, right? It's like, I don't want to open it up in the sermon. Uh, and it's actually not germane to the point that I want to make. You can learn more on your own. Uh, but what Heidi Brisbella said, uh, she wanted to broaden the definition of Christian nationalism. Uh, it's actually kind of a small, relatively narrow movement uh, with actually very little influence, I would argue. Uh, but in her comments, she broadened it to include anyone, she said, literally any Christian that thought that human beings have rights that come not from the Congress nor from the courts, but somehow from God. That's crazy talk, is what she said. Uh, so on that front, I just wanted to read something to you. This is not Heidi Brisbella, but something else. I don't think she's read it, but let me read it. Uh, <laughs> It says this, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. What is this? Do we know? The Declaration of Independence. So just to be clear, it's not the Bible. Like, it's not the Bible. It's not the inspired word of God. It's not perfect. However, it is conveying in this particular instance something biblical. That all men are created equal and they are endowed by their courts. Nope, that's not it. No, they're endowed by their Congress. That's not it either. No, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's where things get a little wonky, and like the, moder the seabeds of modern hedonism are firmly planted in the ground, and look at where we are now. Great. Um, anyway, not the Bible. And so according to some, this is in fact Christian nationalism now. On the way this new correspondent explained it, she thought everyone should be very concerned and maybe even perhaps a little bit scared of these people. Of you, that is. Why is that? And listen to her speak. Uh, it's because they think, you think, you answer to some sort of higher authority than the U.S. government. So I just thought I'd put it out there. Is that true? Uh, absolutely it is. And she says, here's the thing, not in the way that she thinks. Truly, not in the way that she thinks. Nor in the way, I would add, that even many Christians think. Uh, so if you read Martin Luther, he has this particular concept that I think is really helpful on this front. And it's not his concept, he's pulling it from the New Testament as a whole, and maybe more specifically, he's deriving it from the book of Romans in particular. Uh, but what it is, he'll make this distinction between what he calls the two kingdoms. Uh, what he means by that is in this world, there's two types of kingdoms that God has dominion over. Uh, so God has dominion over both. It's not like one is his and the other one's the devil's. That's not what it is. Um, God has dominion over both kingdoms, uh, but one of them is what's typically called the kingdom of the world. And what that is, that's a kingdom that's concerned primarily with human behavior. And so that means it's an external thing. It's visible to the human eye. You can see how people behave. Uh, every human being alive in this world is part of this particular kingdom. You see, the way that God reigns over it, over external behavior, that is, is by what Martin Luther referred to as law. That's what he called it, law. And what he meant by that is things like governmental laws, political processes, and human regulations. All of that would constitute law. And so when it comes to our own nation, the United States in particular, the way these things come about in our country is pretty much every adult citizen can participate in the process. 
And the thing is, every single one of us, I want to be clear on this, every single one of us, Christian and not Christian, voices and votes their convictions. This is not unique to Christians. Literally everyone voices and votes their convictions. And when Christians do it, it's not Christian nationalism, okay? It's just democratic participation. And so that's the kingdom of the world. Everyone's part of it. And yet the thing is, that's not the only kingdom at play in this world. And instead, there's another kingdom that God reigns over. And yet this one is very different. In particular, God's reign over this kingdom is not indirect, but direct. It is not invisible, but visible. It's not for everyone, but only a few. It's concerned not with just outward appearance and behavior, but even more so with the motives and movements of the human heart. And you see, the way that God reigns over the hearts of his people is actually not through law, but rather through grace. Uh, By Christ, that is. And so this is the kingdom that only Christians, not just nominal Christians, but those who know Jesus, only Christians really know about this kingdom. And so if you go back to the question, do we answer to a higher authority? Yes, absolutely. We answer above all to Jesus. And yet it tends to be that those who accuse us thereby of Christian nationalism, they seem to think we're just going to try to force everyone to become Christian. Set up a theocracy. And maybe some people want to try that. I don't really know. Not me. Uh, And yet the historic Christian position is, no, it does not work that way. Uh, There is no, quote, conversion by the sword, is what the medieval church used to say. Uh, The way to put it today in modern terms, there is no true conversion by the government. You see, because the kingdom of Christ is a kingdom of grace, and grace cannot come to a person through force, only through faith. So if we go back to Palm Sunday, notice that when Christ entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he did not go straight to the palace of Pontius Pilate. And instead he went to the temple. And the reason that matters is back then, whenever this new king would ride into a city, uh, he would always go to the palace. That was his place. And the reason for that is that's the place from which you change the laws. In other words, you would overthrow the government by going to the palace. You would enact new policy by going to the palace. You would instigate, in essence, a political revolution. All that happens at the palace, and yet that's not where Christ, came, where Christ went. And that's because that is not why Christ came. Instead, he went straight to the temple. And that's because his kingdom comes to us not through policies, but through prayers. Not by rules would be another way to put it, but by relationship. Not by a subjection that is forced, but by a surrender that is free. Not by an external mode of life, but by an internal change of heart. Ruling in us not from the outside, but from the inside, right? This is the essence of the kingdom of Christ. It comes through through faith, not through force. Now, don't mishear me on this one. This is not to downplay or denigrate the importance of good laws. And say, like, don't worry about voting. Just sit back and be reigned by Jesus. Like, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, We need good laws, right? Especially for the most vulnerable among us who tend to get trampled underfoot by the empires of men. So saying nothing against that, it's just to say that there is something even more important than our laws. And that what Christ came for was not to cultivate a better government or to coerce better behavior. But instead a much bigger project, which is to create people anew. To reign not from without, but from within. To eliminate enemies, that is, dwelling not outside of you, but actually inside of you. That's what he came to eradicate. And that's how his kingdom comes, not force, but faith. So those are the first two things, the kingdom of Christ, not hubris, but humility, not force, but faith. And finally, it lasts, its reign lasts not just temporarily, but eternally. Uh, So when Christ entered Jerusalem, one of the things the crowd said is that he was the, quote, king of Israel, is what they called him. Uh, Other gospels indicate something else. They also say the crowd referred to him as the, quote, son of David. Both of those terms, those references, are actually referred to a promise that God made in the Old Testament, You can see it in 2 Samuel 7. It's called the Davidic Covenant. It's all about how a descendant of David is going to establish an everlasting kingdom. 
the son of David will establish an everlasting kingdom. And so you see what the crowd was saying back then, this is the son of David. What they were saying, and it's notable, a crowd of maybe a hundred people, not a big movement, seemed like it wasn't really going to last, especially how that week went. And yet they were saying, this Jesus Christ will be a king forever. Did they get it right? So a lot of modern historians, hold that thought. Yes, but let's just hold that thought. Uh, A lot of modern historians have begun to note a number of parallels between the decline of the Roman Empire in the third and fourth centuries and what seems to be the current cultural decline of the United States. Uh, There's a lot of similarities. I try to bring them up at home. My wife loves it. It's her favorite topic of conversation. Uh, The decline of America. This is great for 11 p.m. conversation. Anyway, uh, I'm not making any doomsday prognostications, nor am I offering any prophecies about the future of Christians within the United States. Um, However, I do think it's worth knowing that in the Roman Empire, Christians had a very mixed experience. Uh, There's all sorts of writings about them by Christians and also by non-Christians. Um, What non-Christians say is, on the one hand, these Christians are some of the best citizens you could have. They follow pretty much all the laws. They provide refuge for the weak and the weary. They're never really rabble-rousers, but they're actually like respectful, good citizens. They were gentle, people said, and they were kind, and they were pure in heart. It was very weird to everyone. And so on the one hand, you'd think that people would like these Christians. Here's the thing about it. They hated them. The world hated them. The Roman Empire in particular took aim at them, saw them as a threat. You look at the persecution of the church under the Roman Empire. It's atrocious. They literally fed them to the lions in the Roman Colosseum for the amusement of the ruling class. And the question is, why did they do that? If they're not bad citizens, right? And here's why. It's because they refuse to worship the gods of their host culture. Is what the Romans actually write, if you want to look at it. They refuse to worship the gods of their host culture. If you don't think our host culture has its own set of gods, I've got news for you. Both sides of the political aisle, right? Uh, But no, early Christians, they refused. They were different. They saw themselves as belonging to a different kingdom and therefore adhering to the reign of a different king. Uh, Which sounds great in theory in a lot of ways, right? Uh, And yet one thing about the early Christian movement that's easy to forget is it was incredibly small. I think it's a little bit easier now because it's relatively large, but it was very small back then. It was emphatically dwarfed in size and also in influence by the Roman Empire. Back then, Rome was pretty much like the bomb.com of empires. I went to high school in 2001. I thought I'd sneak that in there for, or just to wake you up a little bit and make sure. Uh, That was a cool saying back then. Anyway, sorry. Uh, But no, everyone just kind of assumed that Rome was it, right? It was it. This was the height of human culture and civilization. And that if you got in the way of Rome, to borrow one of our current catchphrases, you were going to end up on the wrong side of history. And so you can imagine the cultural pressure that the Christian community faced. They were dramatically outnumbered. They were totally mocked and made fun of. And like I said earlier, they were fed to the lions. And yet here's the thing about this. Uh, So I studied abroad in college. So they they were stamping out the Christian movement, right? So I studied abroad in college. I use the word study very loosely in that sentence. Like, yeah. But what I remember the most is we were studying in London. We did a lot of traveling all over Europe. We'd get like three to four day weekends. At one point, I think we spent, I think it was three days in the city of Rome. People call it like the eternal city is the nickname for Rome. And you see, one of the things we did is we went to the Roman Colosseum when we were out there. And this force of an empire, right, that used to just mock Christianity, used to see Christians as impediments to national progress, used to assume that their movement would just die out as their empire marched on in glory. And yet, 2,000 years later, I, as a Christian, paid a cool $10 to walk through the ruins of their empire. My question is, whose kingdom really lasted? Theirs 
or that of Jesus? And the reason that matters is that leads to another question. Whose kingdom really lasted? That leads to another question. Which movement really matters or ought to matter to us? Which culture ought we to take our cues from? Whose opinion should we be concerned about? The world's or Jesus's? Jesus is Lord was the earliest Christian proclamation that went out. That was the gospel. And the subtext of it was not Caesar. Jesus is Lord, not the president, which is obviously like very clear to us, right? Um, Jesus is Lord, not the Congress or the courts or the cultural powers or progress that be. Insofar as none of them are, insofar as they're not rooted in the kingship of Christ, some of them might be, some of them are not. Uh, but if they're not rooted in the kingship of Christ, they are all but passing fads. That someday, in the future, people will look back and tour the ruins of as the kingdom of Christ continues to march on, claiming the hearts and minds of all who have ears to hear. Not to be misheard. Um, the last thing I'm trying to do right now is to encourage among us an exaggerated martyr complex. It's not very fun. I think Christians in America in particular, we have a tendency to do this as if it's like we're one election away from being fed to the lions. No, we're not actually. Um, and more to the point, I think the world has no need for Christians to be just one more group of victims who pity themselves. Right? A real martyr is not a victim, but a witness. So all that I'm hoping for on this Palm Sunday is that our witness would not be compromised by the empires of man, but that we gently but firmly stand our ground under the lordship of Jesus Christ in the only truly eternal city, which is not Rome or America, but the kingdom of God. It's marked by humility, not hubris. It comes through faith, not force. And it might look like it's shrinking, but it will go on forever, not just temporarily. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who came to be our king to establish a very different kind of kingdom uh, in this world that we think your kingdom is turned upside down. In reality, it's ours. And so uh, we pray that you would flip your people around. Uh, give us a different set of values, a set of kingdom values, uh, and help us to lean and live into the call of Jesus Christ this week and also in the life we have ahead of us. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.